So we just left with this pretty amazing statement that relates algebraic structures, namely derivations of Rn at a particular point, and vector fields, or more specifically, a vector at a particular point. We know how to take a vector and construct from it a derivation, but how do you construct a vector from a derivation? For this, we need a very important theorem, which is called Hadamard lemma. If f is a function that's differentiable from rn to r, that's an f here, um, differentiable everywhere. In fact, let's just say it's smooth just to make the statement simple. Um, then there exists a function from r n to r n such that, and I'll, I'll phrase this in, in two ways. First, I'll phrase it in terms of a diagram. And that diagram says the following. So if I take, and we're going to do this um, in two different ways. So first, I'm going to duplicate an element x to produce x cross, to produce x comma x. And then what I'll do is I'll apply the identity function cross g. And that's going to land me right in Rn, cross Rn again. And then what I'll do is I will take the inner product of these two points. So the inner product makes sense. The inner product is a function from Rn cross Rn to R. And then what we'll do is we'll just add the image of f at the point 0. And this diagram actually commutes. So what this means is, let's unravel what all of this means. I want you to get used to thinking about diagrams instead of the usual set theoretic notation in terms of where elements go. Um, so let's look at this diagram. It says the element x gets sent to f of x on top here. But x also gets sent to x comma x. And that gets sent to x comma gx. And that gets sent to here. The inner product of x with gx is just the sum of xi gx, uh, the ith component gi x. So this is sum xi gi x. And this is a sum over i from 1 to n. And then we add this to f of 0. So in other words, ie, such that this diagram commutes. Obviously, whenever I say such that I mean that the diagram commutes. So i.e. f of x equals f0 plus the sum from i equals 1 to n xi gix. So this is one important fact. And the proof of the theorem is not that difficult at all, actually. But it's, it involves some clever manipulations and some clever thinking of what kind of functions you should define. And I'll leave you to the notes to check that out, because what I want to prove is that every derivation gives rise to a vector field, gives rise to a vector, and we'll use this lemma. So let me call this 1. And let's also recall, or rather state, two other very important facts about derivations. The first of which is vc applied to any constant function. So vc I'm thinking of as an arbitrary derivation on Rn at the point C is 0. This is true for all constant functions. And third, if f and g are functions that satisfy the condition that their value at C is 0, and again, we're assuming that these are differentiable in order for this derivation to make sense, then if I apply to their product this derivation, I also get 0. Note, it does not follow that if only one of these are 0, then the differential applied to that function is 0. That is false. Take, for instance, the, constant f the, the identity function. That doesn't necessarily satisfy this condition. 
Remember, the identity function from R to R, for instance, is just the function x. And an arbitrary derivation won't necessarily kill that function. Just take, for instance, the partial derivative, or the first derivative. Since it's a function of a single variable, take the vector to be e1, and take the derivation associated to that vector field, you'll just get the element 1, even though f at 0 is equal to 0. So it's very important that both, that we have two such functions and we take their product. So using these three facts, we're going to prove the following theorem. Let, let's write it this way, let Vc be a derivation of Rn at C in Rn. Then there exists a unique vector Vc in um, the tangent space of Rn at the point C such that Vcf equals the differential of f at the vector c. And now that I wrote this statement, I realize that I forgot to mention one other important thing. There's, there's one other condition that this function g satisfies that I forgot to mention here. Um, let me put it at the bottom. 1, g satisfies value of g at 0 equals the partial derivative of f at 0. Forgot to mention that. That's also important in the, in the proof of this theorem. And it follows, it follows actually from the construction of g. So let's give the proof of this theorem using these results. First, let's use this theorem. So write f in the form f0 plus sum. And let me write it now without plugging in x because I want to think of v, this differential, sorry, this derivation at c to act on a function. And we're not plugging in the value of a function at a point, so we really got to be careful with the notation. That's another reason actually why I wrote the diagram instead, so that you can see what it looks like without applying the value x to this function to see this equality. So we can write this as, notice that this I can either think of this as taking the inner product of the identity with g, or I can think of this as the projection on the ith coordinate times g. So that's what we'll do. We'll think of this as the projection onto the ith coordinate times the function g i, and we'll sum over all i. So notice that there's no variable input, and this is an equation of functions. Here, it's an equation of numbers. On the left is f of x, which is a number, and on the right is f of 0 plus another number. Here, this is an equation of functions. This is true for all x. So now what we can do is we can apply v to this. And what do we get? By linearity, it breaks up into these two parts, so vcf equals vc at f of 0 plus the sum of i equals 1 to n, vc, oh, and by the way, um, actually, this is true for all c, but the proof that I'm about to give only works for c equals 0. So let's do this at c equals 0. And I'll leave the proof for you at c non-zero as an exercise. It's a good exercise. So v0, but otherwise, you know, same, same idea. Pi i, so it's this, different, it's this derivation at 0 applied to this function, which is a product of two functions. Now I can use, so this is by linearity, and now I can use this fact here by 2. This just gives me 0 plus and now I'll use the Leibniz rule, which tells me that this is the sum of two terms. And it's the derivation applied to the first term times gi at what point? At 0 plus 
pi i at 0 times the derivation applied to g i at 0. What does this mean? So this, I don't know what this is. g i of 0, we actually have a formula for that. That's um, written down here at the bottom. So let's plug that in. So this is by 3 now. Sorry, by, uh, by 1. And this becomes sum. This is just some number. The derivation um, at the point 0 applied to pi i. That's just a number. So let me write this out clearly. This is just a number. That's also just a number. Um, g i of 0 is exactly the partial derivative of f at 0. What's this second term here? What's the projection of the element 0? That's just 0. So this actually is 0. So that term doesn't even appear. And now we have this form, which is something very, very, very familiar. It's some number times the partial derivative of a function at 0. If we think back when we talked about vector fields and how they act as partial derivatives, as linear combinations of partial derivatives, we know that these are the components of some vector. So we can set vc to be the vector in terms of, let's say, the standard basis. These numbers multiplied by the unit basis vectors. Now we have a vector in Rn, or technically speaking the tangent space at 0, but that is basically Rn. And we can check that when we apply this vector back to this definition, I'll leave that for you as an exercise, you can check that d, and remember this is, sorry, I keep writing c, but it's v0, then d0 f at this vector v0, so I would have to plug in this definition to check to make sure, equals v0 f. And once you check that, that'll be the end of the proof of this theorem that constructs from a derivation at 0 a vector at 0. And the same statement is true even if the point C is not just 0, but it's an arbitrary point of Euclidean space. And what's even more remarkable is that it follows from that fact that if you have a manifold and you look at the tangent space at any point, then you can use a coordinate chart to transfer this theorem. And then you can state an equivalence or an isomorphism of vector spaces between derivations of the manifold at a point C in the manifold and the tangent space with any of the usual definitions we had before, such as the image of the tangent plane from Euclidean space or in terms of curves at points. So we have at least three different ways about thinking about the tangent space to a manifold at a point. One, from using a coordinate chart and pushing forward the tangent plane. Two, in terms of curves, equivalence classes of curves. And three, in terms of operators, in terms of algebraic operators known as derivations that act on functions on the manifold.